see if we can get a laser pointer. There we go. Okay. And perfect. So I'd like to thank so much Susanna and the other organizers at the JGI for the opportunity to be here today and to tell you about our project characterizing carbon cycling in this thawing Arctic peatland. First, some context. Why are we studying Arctic peatlands? Well, northern latitudes host a lot of wet ecosystems shown here in this global lakes and wetlands map. And those overlap appreciably with permafrost areas shown here in Cyan on this Global Soils Database. And of course, these cold, wet conditions preserve a heck of a lot of carbon shown here by the intensity of the brown color on this soil carbon map. And indeed, about a third to a half of the planet's soil carbon is stored in these systems. And this carbon has been frozen for hundreds to thousands of years, locked out of availability to the biosphere, more or less. So conditions in these areas are changing rapidly. As most of us know, the poles are heating disproportionately quickly. And in what many of you may not realize is that they're also getting wetter. Okay? So these carbon-rich soils are now thawing. You can see a particularly dramatic example of that here. Um, so this is thawing ancient organic matter that is now available to the biosphere for the first time in, in this case, thousands of years. And if we project this out over the coming century uh, under the sort of business as usual scenario of RCP 8.5, permafrost is virtually eliminated by the end of the century. Okay, so this has numerous direct consequences to humans. As you can see here, for, our, um, for northern uh, areas, there's a lot of costly infrastructure um, and housing problems where things are collapsing as the permafrost thaws because the ground actually sort of <laughs> collapses. Okay, but there's also a lot of indirect consequences to humans. And that's because permafrost thawing acts as a feast for microbes. So this is likely to be a major positive feedback to climate change. So let's walk through how that works. As the permafrost thaws, it contributes organic carbon to the soil organic matter. And then, depending on soil conditions, that can be decomposed and fermented into acetate, CO2, and hydrogen. Okay? Now, I note that part, depending on local conditions, partially or fully waterlogged soil, we described earlier how Arctic regions are expected to get wetter as well. Okay? So that CO2 that's produced from the ancient carbon can then be lost to the atmosphere. However, you can also have the production of methane under anaerobic soil conditions from either acetate or CO2 and hydrogen. And that methane can then be lost to the atmosphere. And as many of you know, and as indicated by the red highlighting of the methane molecule, it's a really potent greenhouse gas, so about 33 times the global warming potential of CO2 on the 100-year time horizon. Now, these emissions and this effect can be mitigated by the impact of methanotrophs in these systems converting the methane back, okay? And of course, overlaying on all of this is changing new carbon inputs from plant growth because unsurprisingly, as these systems thaw, they can support um, more robust and active plant communities that are pulling down CO2 from the atmosphere, which is a net gain if we're thinking about the global warming scenario. However, if it's anaerobic conditions in the soil, then you can have the situation of a molecule of CO2 in the atmosphere being taken up by those plants, supplied to the below ground soil organic matter pool, and potentially coming back out again as methane, so a 1 to 33 increase in the global warming potential of that molecule of carbon or that atom of carbon. Okay? And then you have this worse situation where that carbon that was in the permafrost which collectively across all of the Arctic, that carbon is more than twice as much as all the carbon currently in the atmosphere. Okay, that carbon can be coming out as either CO2 or methane. Okay, the upshot is that thawing permafrost um, leads to more methane release, which is of particular interest. It's a positive feedback to warming. And the IPCC, the International, sorry, Intergovernment, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which many of you are, are quite familiar with, um, has highlighted this. This is a significant knowledge gap. How large 
this positive feedback is going to be is something that's poorly constrained. So they've highlighted that 3 to 15, which is a pretty big range, 3 to 15 percent of the carbon emitted from soils globally will be coming from um, permafrost systems. And they've also highlighted the fact that very few studies partition this to CO2 versus methane, which of course is important for their differential global warming potential. Okay, now microbes are mediating many of the important unknowns in this process, and these are both known and unknown microbes. Of course, a major theme of the Nelly conference before this and then here at the users meeting has been the idea that we're still discovering so much novelty metabolically and phylogenetically in, among microbes, and so we don't even know who all of these players are. Now, we do know among the organisms that have been profiled that they have different isotopic fractionation. We've heard a lot already about how useful uh, isotopes can be. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of how they're useful in our system for this question. Okay, so if we start out with organic matter here, the processes of methanogenesis, depending on whether it's the acetoclastic or the CO2 reductive pathway, uh, have different uh, fractionation factors, okay? So then you can look at the methane that's produced and say with some likelihood whether it was produced by acetoclastic or uh, CO2 reductive pathways. Now the methanotrophy moves things back the other way because it is um, leaving behind the heavier methane. So its impact on the residual methane from the action of methanotrophy is to move um, its delta C back this way. Okay, so I'd like to just take a pause here. I was talking with the geochemist portion of our team over email yesterday and just chatting about some things. And I was realizing that in fact, you know, this has been a persistent problem for the community. Many, many of us, not just in our project, but throughout our community, use these ranges to make inferences about production, okay? However, those are based on a relatively small number of cultures, and as we all know, we haven't cultured but a handful of the, the total methanogens and methanotrophs that are out there, really, okay? And they're also based on inhibition studies in some particular habitats, like the Everglades, where they partition the community level um, production into acetoclastic versus CO2 reductive. And so do you have a methane cycler in culture? Are you one of those clever people that can grow things? If so, has anybody ever measured its isotopic fractionation? If not, please do it. It's actually really easy, and we're happy to help you if you would like help. But in general, I think as a community, this is something that we can, we can really embrace and do relatively easily and cheaply and really advance uh, our knowledge quickly. Okay, so with that context, I'd like you to bring you now to the isogeny project. So this is where we're trying to unite the power of isotopes and genes, and it's inspired by these two overarching questions that are really some of the grand challenge questions, questions that we're all grappling with in microbial ecology and in ecosystems biology. The first is this persistent challenge of scaling from genes to ecosystems. So many of us are engaged in it, and yet the mechanisms of doing it in our respective habitats can be somewhat elusive. So how do we actually take uh, molecular data from genes, transcripts, and proteins, and then scale up reliably to ecosystem outputs? Okay. The second question is, as we try, and it's a related question, as we try to do this genes to ecosystem scaling, and then predict better outcomes for more reliable um, ecosystem processes for our, our habitats, does that actually require breaking apart the microbial black box that is present in most ecosystem process models? Does that actually improve model accuracy or not? Many of us as microbial ecologists come into this thinking, well, of course it's going to do a better job if we can represent the microbial ecology. But on the geochemistry and the modeling side, they, they often say, no, 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 actually, A, we need to keep things simple to be able to model things accurately, and B, you don't actually need to model all the angels dancing on ahead of a pin to be able to actually represent the process. Okay. So in order to address these two uh, overarching questions, we have sort of the three legs that the isogeny stool stands upon, and that's microbial ecology, biogeochemistry, and modeling. Now, embedded in these four questions, or in these two questions, we're um, asking four specific research questions, 
So first, sort of the obvious one. How does thaw impact methane production and emission from these systems? The second is, what controls this very important CO2 to methane emissions ratio, which really determines the global uh, feedback from these systems to warming? Okay. Uh, third, what uh, describes the dynamics of the new versus old carbon? So how much of that carbon that's coming off the top is actually carbon that was fixed from the new carbon versus uh, carbon atoms that have been locked away for a long time? And finally, what are the implications of all of this for doing a better job at climate modeling? We're engaged in this work at a really remarkable long-term ecological research site, Stordal and Meyer in Arctic Sweden, shown here with this red arrow. And there's been a field station there for over 100 years. So this is really unique for an Arctic field site. So that means that we are blessed with on-the-ground climate data from that exact site from a very long time. It's also been intensively studied. It was actually the location of the very first field methane measurements in the 1970s. Okay. So it's been this long-term focal study site. So this is the field station, and this is the adjacent mire. And you can see it's a mosaic system of wetlands and interconnected post-glacial lakes. Okay. And I won't have a chance, unfortunately, to talk about the lakes at all today, but they're important. So. Um, because of the long-term nature of the research there, that means we have all this great infrastructure that was there and that we were able to, to sort of piggyback onto when we started this work about a decade ago. So we have eddy flux towers, an auto chamber system. Those auto chambers close every three hours all the way through the growing season, every three hours, and they sample for 15 minutes the gases that are being produced. Okay. And then they shuttle them through these wires to carbon gas flux analyzers, which measure not just the concentration of CO2 and methane, but also its isotopes. Okay. And this system is very actively thawing. Because it's at the southern edge of the discontinuous permafrost zone, um, it's actively thawing in front of our eyes as we go back year by year. So that means we have a natural, and I say natural because part of the reason it's thawing so quickly is because of human activities, but we're not adding any extra warming on top of that. So we have this natural thaw gradient going from pulses, and the permafrost is shown as this dotted line here. The active layer is the seasonally thawed portion of the peak column overlying the permafrost. Okay, Pulses, which are dry, intact permafrost, um, and have small shrubs, to partially thawed, um, bogs, and the reason that they're lower is, again, because as the permafrost, the frozen ground thaws, it, its physical structuring collapses, and so it slumps down. Okay, so now you have a perched water table on top of the permafrost that migrates up and down with rainfall, now partitioning the peak column into oxic and anoxic areas. And so you have, it's partly wet, it's partly thawed, and it's dominated by sphagnum, which as um, you've heard something about uh, over the last several days, and as many of you know a lot more about than I do, is a potent um, greenhouse, um, ecosystem engineer. Okay. And then we have the fen, which is fully thawed, fully inundated, and sedge dominated. Okay. So these have different nutrient statuses and different pH regimes. They look very different to the eye you, and require different coring. So there's, there's, um, we have a standardized sampling protocol from our cores, but we have to use different coring across these habitats because they're so very different. So we have our pulses here where the permafrost is still intact. We have our sphagnum bogs here, which are sort of spongy and squishy. And then we have these standing water fens. Okay. And just to give you a sense for the dominant plant inputs here for the change across the habitats, what it actually looks like, we're going from things like cloudberry, this wonderful, delicious Arctic berry that you can make ice cream from and is um, foraged locally through sphagnum peat moss to sedges. Okay. So how are we actually engaged in this ecosystem scale analysis? So we use the auto chambers to tell us about fluxes and isotopes at high resolution. We perform triplicate cores around our auto chambers. We subsample those. We split the subsamples for geochemistry to look at the poor water and bulk geochemistry. Collectively, that can tell us about the quantity of um, the production pathway, the gross versus net production, old versus new carbon, because we can look at C14. 
We can look at the organic matter composition with FTI CRMS and other tools and um, try to characterize the transformations going on in the organic matter. Then we can profile the microbes and viruses by extracting their biomolecules and do sort of the, the standard multi-omics workup of looking at DNA, RNA, and proteins to look at the organisms that are there, their metabolic potential, and what they're actually expressing. Now, our project does this in an iterative fashion with ecosystem process and climate modeling using a range of modeling platforms and a, a suite of different modeling um, partners. Okay. And we do this um, in an iterative fashion with measurements and experiments. And I don't have time to tell you about the experiments today, but we have one branch of our, of our work that's all engaged in, in testing the hypotheses that we come up with from the field. So to accomplish this, of course, takes an interdisciplinary international team. When Scott and I birthed this project about a decade ago, Scott's here in the audience, um, we just had a handful of PIs. And now we've grown to 13 PIs across eight institutions. And then there's the people actually you know, doing much of the work, which is the people in our, in our groups, respectively, shown here, and all of the wonderful collaborators that we're blessed to have, including, over the last couple of years, a, a developing relationship with the JGI, which we're very excited about and appreciative of. OK, so um, because I don't have a lot of time left today, I'm telling you just mostly the results to one question, which is the first question, which is the most obvious one, how does thaw impact emissions? And I'm going to divide this into confirmations versus surprises, because a lot is known about these, these ecosystems already. So many of the things that we're finding, even if they're at unprecedented temporal or spatial resolution or phylogenetic granularity, um, are actually things that were mostly known before. So those are confirmations versus surprises are things that we didn't know about how these systems worked. Okay? And I'm focusing primarily on three new papers and unpublished data. So with unprecedented temporal resolution from those auto chamber systems, we can confirm that thaw increases methane emissions. So we've got these three canonical habitats, the pulsa, the bog, and the fen. And each data point here represents the closure, the average from the closure of 1,400 chamber closures over a given season. And so each dot along here represents a consecutive year. Okay? And so you can see that there's um, heterogeneity between the years, but that overall the FEN shows um, evidence for being a strongly methanogenic environment as we would expect. Okay? However, this allows us to quantify that with lots and lots of measurements, we can now say that here these FENs have seven times the global warming footprint of the initial pre-thaw state of the pulses. Okay? So that's useful for then being able to relate this to models about how the system is going to drive uh, feedbacks in the future, okay? and that accounts for the CO2 changes too. Okay. I'd just like to say that that's the overall pulsa bog fen transition, but that we're getting enough data now from enough years that we're actually able to look within habitats too. So this is just the pulsa, and this is cumulative methane emissions over each year from 2012 to 2018. Okay. So this is depressing but fascinating because even though the permafrost is still intact in the pulsa, it is receding, and we can see that even though in general the pulses aren't making a lot of methane, their production is increasing over the time frame that we've been studying them. Okay. We can also look at the isotopes of the emitted methane, and we see a shift from lighter to heavier, which if we go back to our, our sort of field guide to thinking about isotopic fractionation, that means that the bog versus fen are here, respectively. And so that tells us that we've got acetoclastic methanogenesis or methanotrophy. So there's either more acetoclastic production or oxidation going on. So this confirms that thaw increases methane flux and shifts the uh, underlying processes. And then we can relate this to the actual methane cyclers. Okay? So this uh, is just going to dip our toes into the water of the metagenomic data that we've got, which is from 214. We've actually got a, quite a lot more than this now, but this is from um, publications from last summer looking at the first 214 metagenomes from this site over the first three years of our project. And here we're just taking a gene ecology approach of looking at the MCRA gene. Okay, the columns are going to be the samples. The rows are going to be the main lineages of the methanogens. 
And so we can see here that there is a shift in the methanogen community from the bog to the fen. The red line there is the water table. I mentioned that there's a perched water table okay, that fluctuates up and down. So you can see, of course, that the methanogens are present in the anoxic portion of the, of the habitat, but not the oxic portion. And the only order with the potential to be acetoclastic is these methanosarsenales. Okay. Now, if we, if we get rid, I find it hard to look. I don't really like heat maps. I'm not a huge fan. So if, I, if we get rid of that visual distraction and we look at this, well, okay, maybe there's some increase in the percentage of samples maybe that have the acetoclastic lineages. Okay, but, um, but the relative abundances don't seem to be shifting that much. However, the missing piece of information that you don't have is that our qPCR data tells us that there's actually on the order of two and a half times more cells per gram in the fen. And so the absolute number of acetoclasts is increasing as we go from bog to fen. So that confirms that the thaw increases the abundance of potentially acetoclastic methanogens. And we would have expected that for a range of reasons. Okay. But now we're going to dig into a surprise. Looking at this particular order, the methanosalales, we can see that it rises to high abundance in some of the bog samples. Okay? So in 2014, we described a novel hydrogenotrophic methanogen from a genome we'd recovered from the bog. It encoded all the genes necessary for hydrogenotrophic production, and it expressed the pathway in situ via metaproteomics. Okay? And what was really fascinating to us was that its relative abundance was a better predictor of methane isotopic fractionation in the bog than all of those other typical black box drivers. So that's shown here by the contribution to the improved R squared in a stepwise linear regression model. And this is the relative abundance of that organism. It did an even better job than just looking at water table depth or the quality of the peat, et cetera. So this was perhaps a surprise, depending on which side of the project you stood on, that maybe microbial ecology matters to ecosystem output, with the ecosystem output in this case being the isotopic signature of the emitted methane. So the black box approach did less well than explicit, con the explicit consideration of one specific lineage. And I should clarify here that if we lump all of the hydronotrophic methanogens together, that doesn't do as well. It's really this particular lineage. Okay. So this um, was a fascinating series of discussions over several years with our late project member, Dr. Chang Sheng Li from the University of New Hampshire. And he used to get up at the, the project meetings and say, ah, Virginia, microbes are just slaves to thermodynamics. Okay? And he was, he was a modeler. And, and I wouldn't necessarily argue with that. I would say that there's a lot of different ways to interpret the results that we've got. Okay? Okay, the other interesting thing was that this novel methanogen is distributed globally. So Ben Woodcroft in Gene Tyson's lab was leading this work, and he went and looked at um, habitats around the world from 16S surveys, and he sees it all over the place in methanogenic uh, environments. Okay. And then what's been exciting is in the four years since that initial description of this lineage, we've now got 51 more genomes for this um, lineage, and that expands it to its own novel order with habitat-specific clades. Okay. And what's cool is that even with the metagenomic data um, and the read recruitment-based relative abundance assessments of this lineage over more years, we still see that it's a disproportionately good predictor of ecosystem outputs. Okay. So it's sort of a surprise that it's so diverse and divergent. And then the other thing is that we've identified through the other genomes that we've recovered this um, evolutionarily conserved potential syntrophy. So we found an acidobacteria that always showed up and co-varied with the um, methanoflorins. And through metabolic reconstruction that Gene's lab did, we saw that there's this potential for interspecies hydrogen transfer fueling the hydrogenotrophic methanogen. Okay. And then what was really cool is that there was a closely related species pair of the similar lineage of the acidobacteria, similar lineage of the methanoflorins, but just offset slightly within each um, clade group that occurred in the fen. And so it seemed like potentially there's evidence that this syntrophy, potential syntrophy, is evolutionarily conserved. And so, of course, we're following up on this now. Okay, so this, this represents where we start digging into increased iterative measurements and experiments to test these hypotheses. Okay. 
So how does thaw impact the consumers? So we can do the same thing we did with MCRA, but for PMOA, the marker gene for methanotrophy. And I'm showing you the data in a slightly different form here, and you'll see why. Instead of showing you as a heat map, I'm showing you stacked bar charts for the pulse of bog and fen. And you can see that um, the methanotrophs become more, um, more diverse in the fen. Okay. So thaw shifts methanotrophy from a methylocystaceae dominance in the pulsa and bog to methylococcaceae in fen, and that confirms what we would have thought about these sorts of, um, these sorts of systems. But there's a lot of other lineages going on there too. And through the recovery of mags from the site and then detailed uh, reconstruction of the methanotroph mags, um, Caitlin Singleton on the project was actually able to describe some novel methanotrophs. There we go. So one cool thing is that she recovered a USC alpha methanotroph. Now these are known, I started my graduate work at Stanford years and years ago before we moved out east to MIT, and I was working with Brendan Bohannon and Pam Matson at Jasper Ridge, and we were looking at USC alpha there because it is a grassland methanotroph. It's got a high affinity methane monooxygenase that's sucks down atmospheric concentrations of methane and is present in grasslands and forests, etc. Well, it turns out that it's at our site as well, and Caitlin recovered the very first genome for this globally distributed and potentially quite important methanotroph. So that was cool, useful. Um, and then the other interesting thing that she discovered was that there was a hyphomicrobiaceae that had never before been, like we, we didn't know that that lineage could do methanotrophy, and she found very strong evidence that it's doing that. So we're following up on that now. Okay, so, but are all those methane consumers actually consuming? So now we can overlay the metatranscriptomic data down below that relates to these stacked bar charts up above from the metagenomes, okay? And we can see that no, not all of that diversity is actually present in what's being transcribed, okay? So the abundance of an organism does not reflect linearly its activity, but that's not necessarily a surprise. Many of us would have guessed that anyway, so confirmation surprise, potato, potato. But the dominant lineages are the active ones, which is interesting. Okay. And then the other cool thing is getting back to thinking about how these systems are actually working and changing with permafrost thaw. Okay. We see that there's an appreciable oxidation signal in the waterlogged fen, which means that there's likely mitigation of methane emissions happening. And that's probably due to the arenchymal transport by the sedges of O2 to ventilate the subsurface. Okay. So, yes. Okay, now of course um, emissions don't only depend on methanogens and methanotrophs. There's this complex upstream web of carbon emissions that are fueling this. Okay, so what microbes are performing these transformations and how do they change with thaw? And how do the products and substrates through this process change with thaw? So now we are armed with 1,500 mags representing and, and counting, um, representing about 60% of the Meyer cells at the genus level. Okay. And so we're, we're slowly inching our way towards more holistic ecosystems biology characterization. We can map these onto upstream carbon processing. And apparently I talked way faster when I was practicing, so now we're gonna skip some things. Okay, so we can map this on um, and we see that there is, in fact, here we go, uh, a change in carbon degradation associated with thaw. And we found surprises here, too. So a previously fungal xylan oxidoreductase is not just fungal. It's actually in bacteria, it's abundant, and it's functional. So again, expanding sort of novel metabolisms. And thaw shifts carbon processing towards simpler polysaccharide degradation, fermentation, and acetogenesis. Okay, so I'm going to have to skip over this, but um, I'd like to just highlight the Malakta Thiele, formerly of Emsil and now, now of the University of Arizona, and Joel Boyd and Jean's lab are um, soon going to be submitting a paper that links the FTICRMS DOM profiles to the actual metagenomes in some really cool and exciting ways that advance our understanding of the ecosystem.
Okay. And then really the crux of what we're trying to do is now distill, working with Owen Brody's group, distill the insights we're gaining from this into models of the ecosystem that partition the microbes into distinct functional guilds and thereby try to do a better job of understanding the actual system changes and then drop that into larger scale models like ECOSYS, which we're working on with Bill Riley and his group um, to say, can we adjust parameters in these larger scale climate models to reflect the knowledge that we're gaining through deep study at this site? Okay, and I can't tell you about viruses, but they're awesome. And I refer you to um, Dr. Joanne Emerson is actually here in the audience. There we go, that's my timer. Um, Dr. Joanne Emerson is here in the audience and I'm sure she would love to tell you about her really great paper from last summer um, describing much of this work. Okay, so to summarize, how does thaw impact carbon production? We confirmed that it increases methane flux. Um, we saw that methanogens increase in abundance and diversity, including acetoclasts. We saw this surprise that thaw increased the abundance and diversity of methanotrophs, and that oxidation is likely mitigating emissions in the fen. And of course, this is, this is important because as these systems are warming, both with the shift from pulsa to fen, but within each ecosystem, the methanotrophs and methanogens uh, can be dis responding differently to warming, okay? So if mitigation is happening now, will it be happening more or less in the future? These are questions we're actively trying to figure out right now. Okay, and then viruses. And then more broadly for our two overall questions, microbial ecology maybe matters to ecosystem output. MAG recovery, unsurprisingly for this group, expands our view of who does what in interesting and unexpected ways. Activity does not equal, or abundance does not equal activity. And soil viruses are really awesome. So I just got a chance to tell you about the first question of these today. Um, we're trying to do this work in this holistic context, and this really takes a village. So I'd like to conclude by saying that we have data and metadata from approaching a decade now. I just got to tell you about a little bit of it, but we're really, for this scale of project, we're actually a pretty small group of people trying to do this on really not actually that much money, but we have beautiful data and beautiful metadata, and we love to collaborate with folks. And so if you have an organism that you know a lot about or a process that you're really interested in, please come play. Okay, and with that, I'd like to thank all of our funding sources and all of you for your time and all of our project members.